Hello, this is Dane Cialino, and welcome to our class on case map document importing and filtering. Now, that's the title of the class, but what we're really going to deal with, in addition to importing and filtering documents, is also Bates numbering and using importing and filtering to produce uh, documents to your opponent, uh, including document indices, exhibit lists, privilege logs, and uh, and once you manage to learn those basic tasks, you'll know a lot about filtering documents and uh, then you can customize your filters and tables in a way that will make uh, case map useful to you in any particular case. Okay, well, of course, we're talking about case map, which is the uh, LexisNexis product that is used for case level organization. Uh, in our last lecture, we did an overview of case map. You should by now have downloaded it and started to um, play with the program yourself to get a sense for how it works and, um, and continue uh, kind of manipulating documents, fields, people, and whatnot. As you may recall, last time we uh, discussed that case map is a table-based way of organizing information. And this is what a case map table looks like. It's very uh, familiar in format. And we talked about how the queen table, uh, the fact table, is really the principal table. It's uh, where most of your work is being done, your, pr your primary work is being done in case map uh, by organizing those facts, which are the atoms of your cases. Uh, now, the other tables are the uh, worker tables. They essentially service the fact table. Why? Because all facts, um, or most facts, are going to be sourced to a document. Uh, could be a memorandum, could be a photograph, could be a business record, but the, the document table is, uh, is probably the second most useful or, or, or worked table. Then the person's table, most facts are sourced to a person or involve people, all of them do. So uh, you have to keep track of those people and you do that on the people table. Issues, all facts are relevant to cases because they bear on some issue that's important to the case. And th those issues are logged and tracked uh, on the issue table. And then finally, there's the question table, which is just essentially a running to-do list of things that need to get done and projects that have been assigned to others on your team. All right, well, back to the document table because that's where we're going to pick up for today's uh, lecture. As we said, documents are merely sources for facts that's why they are a worker table. They service that more important fact table. When you collect and you start to organize documents, uh, you are going to put them on your document table with a using a descriptive name. Again, we've talked about how uh, important it is to get a detailed description of a document rather than just uh, using some number that doesn't mean anything. It needs to uh, and again, that descriptive file name should have a date embedded in it and also should have the author and it should have uh, some detailed description about what the document relates to. Documents should have a date on the, on the document table and documents should have a Bates number. Um, and again, more on Bates numbering uh, now. What does the document table look, look like? Well, as we've previously discussed, this is uh, the document table looks very much like the fact table. All of these tables look similar, uh, but the document table is typically going to have a left column with a date and then a Bates beginning, a Bates ending, a short name, an automatically generated number of pages, and then a very detailed uh, full name that is going to generally have the date, the author, and a description of the document. You also may want to include the source of the document so you can keep track of where you got the document uh, and then the linked file. Well, that's what the document table looks like. Um, how do you go about organizing documents? And this is where we segue into our discussion for today. Well, the very first thing you need to do is you need to either scan all of the documents that you get into PDF. And if they already come as a PDF, structure the documents by splitting the documents into uh, different... Um, into... Uh, into smaller documents. Remember, one document per file is something that's very important to keep in mind. So how do you go about uh, splitting documents? 
Well, we'll discuss uh, that shortly as one of our first uh, um, our first demonstrations. Then you need to Bates number all the documents. We're going to take that up on our second demonstration. You will then import them into Case Map, and it's very important to use the Acrobat utility to do this. And uh, we'll do that in our second demonstration this, uh, on this lecture. You want to then add document information to the case map fields, including the date and any other information that you might be tracking, such as the source of the document. And uh, then uh, once the documents are in case map, you are ready to go. OK, well, let's now turn to our demonstrations by looking at document importing and filtering in action. After you receive a stack of documents, and by a stack I don't mean literally a stack of paper documents, but a uh, set of documents from uh, your client or perhaps from your opponent as a single document, uh, let's go find those, uh, those documents. Um, they are in materials, sample exhibits. Okay, now the documents would arrive like this. Notice what this is. This is a nine-page single document, but what it really contains is, see, this says Exhibit 1 at the bottom. This says Exhibit 2. This says Exhibit 3. It contains really not just one document, but it contains several documents. As we know, one critical thing for you to do is to structure the documents into individual Acrobat files. So the way to do that, and I've already uh, done this in advance, is I've gone ahead and I've put bookmarks at, the, uh, at each one of these uh, documents, uh, where each new document begins. Now that I've put the bookmarks in, into this single Acrobat file, I can open up Split Document. I'm going to split to top level bookmarks. And I'm going to use the bookmark names for file names. Now that I've done that, I'm going to hit OK. And this now says the document has been successfully split into eight documents. And let's see if that, in fact, happened. Yes, it did. You can see that we now have eight individual documents named using the right protocol. Now that I have made eight individual documents, I am ready to Bates number them and import them in to case map. Now that we have split the single PDF document into a number of individual documents, now we need to case number them. And to case number them, you use the Acrobat plugin for case map. Now, first issue is how do you load the Acrobat plugin for case map? It should load automatically when you load case map onto your computer. Now, of course, you have to have Adobe Acrobat Standard or Pro loaded on, onto your computer as well because, obviously, you can't do this with Acrobat Reader. You need to use Acrobat Pro uh, or Standard. Uh, now, assuming that you've got the right version of Acrobat on, it, on, your, uh, on your computer, and assuming that you have just loaded case map, once you do that, then this plugin should automatically appear and give you a number of options. Now, as far as options, the, uh, the first option that we need to consider is bait stamp PDFs. And all you do is you go to this, you click bait stamp PDFs, and it says welcome to the case map bait stamp utility. And it does give you this warning that that the utility is going to modify PDFs and it won't create backup copies of your files. And uh, once it once it stamps these documents with PDFs, the documents are stamped. So it goes on to say that the utility will recognize PDFs containing case map and Acrobat bait stamps by default. By default, files containing case map or Acrobat bait stamps will be ignored. Why are they going to be ignored? Because we only want to Bates number documents once. And once they've been Bates numbered, we don't want to do it uh, again. OK, so here we are in the Bates uh, stamp utility. We click Next. Now we have to add all of the files that we want to Bates stamp. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to go into um, our case file, and our case file is located here. Okay, you will see now all of the documents that we previously split into separate documents. We're going to add all of these by just highlighting from the first to the last, and there they are. We've just selected the PDF files we want to bait stamp, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in there. All right, and it says ignore. I've checked ignore PDFs that are already bait stamped. Why? Because if we've already bait numbered some of these, we don't want to do it again. It also really does make it easy in the future when you want to add a couple of documents into that file folder. It just uh, ignores the ones that you've already processed. All right, now we want to create a new Bates numbering format. I always, uh, it asks you first, what is the maximum number of pages you expect to Bates stamp with this Bates format? I can't imagine, or I hope I'm not involved in any case that involves more than 100,000 pages of documents. And this allows you to choose up to a billion. Uh, that's ridiculous. If you've got a case with a billion docu documents or one million pages of documents, you need to get a new life because you are going to be miserable. So I always check 100,000 and thank God I've never had a case that involved more than 100,000 pages of documents. I'm going to start the numbering at page one, logical enough. Do you want the format to include a prefix? I uh, recommend that you always use a prefix so you know which documents at any time when you look down at them um, are documents that you have bait stamped. So, do I want to include a prefix? The answer to that is yes. And let's just uh, say that the prefix here is going to be DSC because those are my initials. Usually what I'll use is, if it's a lawyer disciplinary case, I'll use the client's, the client's uh, initials. Again, it just makes it clear that these are documents that, that I have produced. Now the case name, and we're going to call this Cialino Sample Case. Now why is it important to come up with a case name? Because as you add additional documents in the days or weeks to come, you want to have the formatting all set up for Bates numbering documents already. So you, you can, uh, it'll know what number to start at. It'll know what font and font size to use because you've already chosen that. So that, this will give you a consistent and consecutively numbered series of Bates numbers for your documents. That's why it's important to add the name. All right. Now it asks me to review the case Bates numbering format and gives me the option of changing the format settings and beginning Bates numbers. I do do this. Now, of course, remember, I've already told it to use the prefix uh, DSC. The increment is going to be 1. Uh, so that means that we're going to begin at DSC 00001 and we're going to end at DSC 00009. Uh, right now we're going to base number 9 pages. We can base number a num uh, maximum of 100,000. Thank goodness we're not going to base number more than that. Now as to the font, I generally increase the size of the font to 12. And I generally put the base numbers, my base numbers, at the top right hand side of the page. Why? Because I'm completely paperless. When I open up a document, I want to immediately see what the Bates number is. So again, most, almost everybody puts them at the bottom right. I put mine at the top right just because it's easier when you're looking at documents on a screen to see the page numbers. That way you don't have to scroll down to see what the Bates number is. It says set page labels to Bates numbers. And again, that's just a matter of making the page numbers the same as the Bates numbers. Um, and fill Bates number background solid white. Do that because uh, that way the numbers will show up. All right, now choose the order in which they'll be stamped. I mean, I can move them up and move them down. I, I rarely do this. It's just an option in case you'd like to. All right, now it tells me that I've selected eight PDFs with a total of nine pages to Bates stamp. The Bates numbering will start at DSC 00001 and continue to DSC 00009. It'll be written with a 12 point. Remember, I made that change. 
Helvetica font, black in color. The stamps will be located in the top right of each page. Yeah, just like I planned. It then warns me again that the Bait Stamp Utility modifies PDFs and does not create backup copies. If you want to make backup copies, do them yourself before proceeding. Now, I never do that. I've never gotten a problem. I've gotten into trouble by doing that. Also says if you have PDFs that contain only images and no text, you will not be able to OCR them in Acrobat once they have case, uh, case uh, map bait stamps. Now that's important. If it's important to to run uh, OCR optical character recognition on your documents before you bait number them, and uh, that way uh, because once you bait number them, you don't have that option anymore. Okay, now uh, after you have uh, reviewed and checked the specs for your base number, you say you check this box that says I have read the above summary and I am ready to proceed. Hit finish, and there it is. It says the Kate's Map Bait Stamp Utility has finished processing eight PDFs. It has successfully stamped eight PDFs. So so far so good. Now the next question becomes send these PDFs to case map after closing this message and we want to do that so we hit close and it says welcome to the send PDFs to case map utility now we hit next and and of course we, we could read what this does it says use this utility to send multiple PDFs to a case map case it will add a new case map record linked to each PDF you select which makes this very powerful for uh, handling cases with all digital documents. Once we have the document uh, sent over to case map, it's always going to be linked. The utility is done to avoid creating duplicate records in case map. It will not create a new record for a PDF that is already linked to an existing case map record. If a PDF has case map or Acrobat Bates numbers, this utility will update the linked case map records Bates number fields. fields. If a PDF has multiple Bates numbers, this utility will not import Bates numbers into case map for that PDF. Okay. These are the documents I want to send to case map. They're all the ones we just Bates numbered. Now, it tells me in order to use this utility, you must have case map 7 or higher running on this computer. Well, I've got the program. You can see the icon down here on the bottom left. But now I've got to launch case map. Well, what I've got to do is, is create a new case. So I'm going to do that. We're going to call this sample case. And then it's going to ask me where to put it. And I am going to put it where the other one find it oh, no. yeah where are my documents there we go yes see classes litigation there we go Materials, sample. Yeah, I always create a, form, a folder in my case file called work product, and that's where I always put my case file. So, okay, I've entered the name of the case file. It's called sample case. I'm going to put it in the folder, the work product folder, and um, here we go. Okay, I've just created a new doc, a new case map file called sample case. Right now, you see there are no documents in it. There's nothing in it. There are no facts, no uh, people, no documents, no nothing. So what I need to do, of course, is I need to now that I've opened up a new case map case called sample case, and I want to put these documents on the document spreadsheet. I hit next. Now it'll ask me what information to put where in case map. Now the object full name, that's the description of the document on the document field. I want that to be the PDF file name. And why do I want it to be the PDF file name? Remember how much trouble we went through to name our PDF files? 
We're very careful to put the date in there, very care careful to put a detailed description of what the file folder was, uh, excuse me, the, the document was. Why? Because we're going to use that name for the detailed description of the document that we bring over to case map. Right? Now, the object's short name is going to be the PDF Bates number beginning. Uh, why is that? We want to have as few identifying markers on documents and numbers as possible. You know, sometimes in cases, some lawyers will have a single document. It'll be Exhibit 3 in one deposition. It'll be Exhibit 2 in another deposition. Uh, it'll be referred to by Bates number in another deposition. I want to refer to a single document by the same number across depositions. I don't want to give it new exhibit numbers. I'm always just going to call it by its short name. And its short name is always going to be the PDF uh, Bates beginning number. So that's why I'm going to set the object short name to the PDF Bates beginning number. And then I'm going to hit next. And it says you have eight PDFs selected to send to the document spreadsheet in the following case map case. It's sample case. Eight of them have PDF numbers and press finish. All right, now it's processing the records and it says the bulk send to case map is complete. A total of eight records were processed from document previewer. Eight new records were added to case map. So where, how do we know that? We go over here and we open up documents and there they are. You can see that they uh, the file name has now become the full name. The short name is the uh, Bates number, the first Bates page number, and then it automatically tells you uh, how many pages we have. Now, we can add additional fields, like for example, and what I've done here is I've just right-clicked on this full, on this bar up at the top, and it says Insert Fields. I'm going to insert Bates Beginning and Bates End just to show you those and I'm going to insert the date field. All right. Now the date field, the way that I usually structure my document pages would be like this. All right. So what we have now that we brought these documents over, the date field, the full name field, the Bates beginning, the Bates end and the short name. You can see the short name is always the same as the Bates beginning. See how very organized this is. Now, the next thing that I would do, now that I've brought all of these documents over, I could sort these documents chronologically by date by just sorting ascending here or descending if I want to go in reverse chronological order. Why? Because the full names, just like the file names, begin with the date in the format that we've previously discussed. But you know, usually I will fill in, I will populate the date field, and it's very easy to do here. 01, 25, 12, excuse me, 12, 01, 22, 12, 01, 18, 12, 11, 02, 12, 10, 26, 12. 10, 19, 11. Oh, actually, I've made a couple mistakes, but I'll fix them. 0, 09, 25, 11. 0, 09, 17, 11. Now I need to fix the ones that I put 12 in, right? This is 10, 26, 11. 11, 0, 2, 11. Okay, now you can see what I've done is I've now populated this field and I've got all the documents that I can now sort using this date field. nice thing about this is it also fills in the actual day that it happened and it does that automatically, uh, which is nice. Now, uh, there we have it. We have Bates numbered eight documents. We have imported them into case map using the case map uh, import feature. Uh, we now, because we've imported them into case map, we now have these little paper clips on the far left. And the beauty of these paper clips is this. It allows you to click on the paper clip and open the document. There it is. Now you can see the document now that I've opened it has got the Bates number on the top and it's got our full document. So uh, 
there it is. We have successfully imported eight documents. Before we did it, we Bates numbered them. Once we have the import, that gives us a link to the document using the paperclip that we can then click on and open in Acrobat with uh, the Bates number up at the top left. And there it is. Now that all the documents have been successfully brought into case map, and importantly, since we have brought them in using the case map plugin for Adobe Acrobat and have all of the source documents linked, and we know that they're linked because of the paperclip. Also, if we wanted to look at this individual file information, we would uh, could scroll down and see here on linked file exactly where the linked file is. Again, we kind of, we know where it is, but that gives us the ability to check it. And, and, and assuming that we've done that, and this is what's so critically important, you have to have done that, uh, have the paper clip on the left-hand column in order for what we're going to talk about now to actually work. And what we're going to talk about now is how you would go about producing these documents to your opponent. One of the most unpleasant things about lawyering is discovery, producing documents, answering interrogatories. As unpleasant it is, as it is, it's an absolute necessity in civil litigation. There's much less of it in criminal litigation, but it's an absolute necessity in, in civil litigation. So you need to know how to do it. Well, that's the bad news is it's unpleasant. The good news is, is that if you have used case map to import all of your documents, then it becomes a task that is pretty easy. Why? Well, because all of the documents in the whole case are here on the document table. What you now need to do is to decide which one of the which of these documents you want to produce. Well, to do that, um, we'd look at the documents, look at the requests for the documents, and find which ones are responsive. And then what I would do is I'd come up with a new field. And the new field, the simple one, might be, um, let's see, it might be, produce to, we'll just call it produce to opponent. And then we're going to make it a check mark, a check box. Now, you can see what, now that we have added the field, all we need to do is to check the ones that we're going to produce. Now, I could have added this as another field. I, I could have um, you know, often it would probably be better, better to to make this a kind of a drop down list of the dates that you do various productions, so you can keep track of when documents were produced to the defendant, uh, or you can do it by check by way of check mark, and that's just an easy way to do it as well. All right, but well, let's suppose we want to produce this one, this one, this one, and that one, but we don't want to produce the rest. They might be privileged, they might be work product documents, they might be irrelevant. How do we produce just those documents to our opponent? Well, what we do is we filter. And Case Map gets much of its power from its ability to sort and filter records. All of these documents are records in the case. You can see up here on the right hand uh, record count that we have eight records in this entire case. But what I want to use is this filter functionality to filter out documents that do not have a check mark. Why? Because I would like left on this page only the documents that I'm going to produce. And if I have only the documents that I'm going to produce, then I can easily bundle those together for production. And not only bundle them together for production, but produce automatically an index to the produced documents. Okay. So let's filter out the ones that we are not going to produce. And then the simple way to do this is just to right click on the check. And it says filter by selection, which means we're going to filter out everything else. And kind of notice up at the top right now we have eight records. Watch when we filter. Now it says filtered. We only have four records. The only ones that are left are the ones with the check marks. 
It's almost magic. Now, that's all we have, is we have, uh, these are the four documents that we're going to produce to our opponent. What next? Well, next we need to decide what we want to show, what, what our index is going to look like. Right now we've got this produce to opponent field. We probably don't want that, right? So I'm going to hide that field. I want the date field in my index. I want the full name in the index. I want the Bates begin and the Bates end, probably. But I, I may not. To make it easy, let's just hide that field and hide that field. Now, I, have I deleted the data? No, it's still there. I'm just hiding it from this particular uh, table at this particular time. How do I know it's still there? If I look at the record detail, you can see the Bates beginning and Bates end are still there and the produce to opponent that we added is, uh, is still there, right here. Produce to opponent is still there. So that information is still contained in the record, but it's just not showing itself on this table. And why is it not showing itself on this table? Because right now I'm getting ready to generate an index. Now, what is the index going to look like? I'm going to go up here and look at print preview. And it's going, to, uh, it's going to generate a preview of the document that I'm going to produce. There it is. Okay, and what, what this, now you can see it has, is it says sample case. It says uh, these are the documents. Now I can change that by going into this page setup report options and then instead of the title being documents uh, produced to opponent on July uh, in July 2013 now when I generate a preview there it is documents produced to opponent in July 2013 We'll have the case name here. It's got the uh, who, who produced this uh, or made the document, and this is what it looks like. If we were to zoom in to take a look at it, it's going to show the title of this report, documents produced to opponent, the date and the time it was uh, created, shows the filter, the date, and, and just the fields that I, I chose that I wanted to include, the date, the full name, the short name and the number of pages. Now, could I change this? Yeah, if I want to take out some of this information, for example, um, I may want to take out the date and time, the page number, and what will that? How will it look different then? You could see up at the top, the page number is gone, the date and time are gone, but that filter is still in there. If I wanted to take that out, I would take out the subtitle. See the subtitle filter? I would just delete that. And now what do we have? A beautiful uh, indexed, beautifully indexed sample case here. All right, now. OK. Here's our index. Now, the nice thing about the index is what we're going to do is we're going to print this index to PDF. And we do that right here, print to PDF. And all we're going to do is we're going to create, I'm just going to put it on my desktop for now, a document, a PDF document entitled Documents Produced to Opponent in July 2013. Now, if that's all we were doing, it'd be pretty simple. We would just save it and we'd open it and there it is here we are in pdf and we've got a nice pdf index of all the documents we're going to produce now this is what case map used to do before one of the more recent revisions to the to the product is uh, you would just take the the index pdf index print it out not print it out but uh, then attach uh, along with it all of the documents that are uh, that are responsive, but you'd have to go through and manually find them. Well, now you don't have to do that anymore. And let me show you this. This is uh, really just incredibly powerful. 
Again, these are the documents that we're going to produce to our opponent. We have got paper clips next to them all, so we know that we've got documents automatically linked, which is uh, not just good, but critical, indispensable for what we're going to do now. We are going to print this index to PDF. We're going to put it on the on my desktop. Okay, and now this is something we just briefly skipped over last time and hit no. But read what this says. It says the report you are generating contains links to one or more documents. Do you want case map to embed copies of these documents within the PDF report? Look what, P look what case map is going to do. It's not just generating an index, but it's going to embed each of these copies of each of these four documents within the PDF report. So watch how this works. Again, all four of the documents that are attached for a total file size of 75.4 kilobytes. And the report has been saved as an Adobe PDF file. Do you want to open it now? And we open it. And here it is. Well, this looks pretty much the same, doesn't it, as what we just saw. It is a um, PDF file. It's got, it says documents produced to opponent. doesn't have the, the, uh, the date on it anymore because we removed that or the subtitle. But look what's different about it. It has paper clips on it. And look what happens when you click on the paper clips. The documents are linked to the index. Now, where are they? Well, notice that they have paper clips. And notice this paper clip over here. This paper clip opens the attachment pane. These documents. Now remember, what we're looking at now is a single PDF file called Documents Produced to Opponent in July 2013. Just to show you that it's a single PDF document, we can go to my desktop, and there it is. Single PDF document. We'll open it up, and there it is. Now we see the bookmark pane here. Let's go to the... But if we open up the Attachments pane, we can see that this single PDF document has other PDF documents attached and embedded within this document. Well, the, the beauty of that, that allows this linking to link and open any attached PDF. But also, when we send this single PDF to our opponent, we're sending him all of the responsive documents as embedded in ta attachments. Well, now how does he get them out of this document? Very simple. You go to the attachments pane and you highlight all of them and you hit, I'm sorry, you're going to hit save as, save attachment. Where are we going to save them? We're going to save them on the desktop. And when we go to the desktop, look, those are all the documents. We just saved them. We just pulled them out of our single PDF, and we now have them uh, as individual files. All of this powerful functionality that we see here on the attachments pane is, re is, is solely a uh, result of having brought in the PDFs, first of all, Bates numbered them, brought in the PDFs as um, using the case map import functionality, and again, checking to make sure that they are all properly linked with paper clips. We filter out the documents that we want to produce. We check the, the, the report page to make sure that it's got all of the information we want and whatever information we don't want. Then we, again, print to PDF, and when we print to PDF, it's going to ask us whether we want case map to embed copies of these documents within the report. We do. We can double check which ones we're embedding, and then when we open it, uh -oh. and then when we open it up, uh, then we'll have the ability to, um, to have all of the files as attachments. 
again, very powerful uh, functionality that is uh, really does make one of the most unpleasant of all unpleasant tasks in litigation uh, a little bit more uh, manageable, if not more enjoyable. Okay, now let's talk about creating an exhibit list. Now, assuming that these are all of the documents uh, in the whole case, and again, this is our sample case. A real case is going to have more than seven documents, but just assuming that these are all the documents in the case, and that you decided you want to use uh, five of them as exhibits, and you've got to produce an exhibit list. Almost every case that has a pretrial order is going to have a requirement that you produce an exhibit list or file an exhibit list with the court uh, at some point during the litigation. So how can we do that easily with case map? Well, again, you start uh, on the on the uh, field, or excuse me, the documents table with all of the possible documents. Then what I would do is I would add a column for exhibit. So how do we do that? Well, we right click on this and we put insert fields, scroll down to exhibit, C-E-X, and now we have an exhibit field. Well, now we need to populate the exhibit field with our exhibit numbers. And the nice thing is, uh, one way to do this would be just to go and type one, each one of them uh, by hand, which you could do, and there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, there's not really much more to say. If you decided that you wanted to make this uh, plaintiff's exhibit one, you would probably do it like this, by hand. This might be plaintiff's, excuse me, plaintiff's exhibit two, and so on. That would be one way to do them, do it, but there's an automated way to do it. Once you've decided all of these, uh, well, actually, when you're looking at the exhibits, I would put yes for the exhibits that I want to keep. All right, now that I've decided I want to make these five documents exhibits, what I want to do is filter out the documents that will not be exhibits. And how do I do that? I put my cursor over the Y for yes, right click, and say filter by selection. And there it is. I've just left the records that uh, contain the exhibits that I want to list on my exhibit list. Okay, now the next thing I want to do is I want to fill in this uh, these exhibit numbers. To do that, I would go to Tools, Case Tools, and Auto Number Records, because that's what we want to do. We've got all of these records. There are only five of them, and we want to auto number them, number them one through five. And we get a warning that says this utility sequentially numbers the records in the current spreadsheet using a specified starting number and increment. You need to have a number or text field in the spreadsheet before proceeding, which we have date and the destination field will be overwritten. Okay, that's fine, we're ready to go. The field we want to number is the field for exhibit. And we want to enter our starting number, which is going to be exhibit one. The increment is one, we're going to go to one, two, three. The total number of digits has got to be uh, at least five. Now, I don't like this field, I wish you could only do two, but five is the minimum number. And then it says, enter the prefix or leave the box blank for none. Well, almost always, you're going to want to have a prefix for your exhibit numbers. If you're the defendant, you would want to have D as your prefix. If you're the plaintiff, usually you want to have P. So uh, assuming that we're the plaintiff, I would type in P, hit OK. And now again, it's warning me that I'm about to number the exhibit field from zero one, from plaintiff's exhibit one through plaintiff's exhibit five, and that all the data in the exhibit field will be overwritten, including those little Ys, which is not a problem. And there we go. Okay, so now we have exhibits, plaintiff's exhibit one through plaintiff's exhibit five. Now I am going to uh, want to produce uh, or put together my exhibit list. How do I do that? Well, again, since I only have plaintiffs uh, exhibit one through five, remember I've got, it's filtered. There are three documents that are not numbered as plaintiffs exhibits and won't, will not be listed on the exhibit list. So what do I do? I go here, 
Now, this says documents produced to opponent in July 2013. I'm going to need to change that. And I change the report title to Plaintiff's Exhibit List. And now it says Plaintiff's Exhibit List. And it lists, as you can see here, just the exhibits. Now, what I would probably need to do is, I, since it's an exhibit list, I'm going to want to sort them by exhibit number. So that's easy to do. All I do is put this over here. Now, let's see, I've put as the leading column the exhibit, and I'm going to sort ascending. Uh oh. What did I do? I want to cancel this. All right. Now what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to get rid of these other documents. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to filter containing text. Exhibit P. Okay. I want to cancel that. I want to filter by selection. P. There we go. Okay. So right now I've just filtered uh, and I've kept only those documents that have the text P. Now, just for the future, I want to save this and I'm going to call this plaintiff's exhibit list. Right, so once I cancel it, if I want to apply it again, I just go filter, my saved filters, and that, here it is, plaintiff's exhibit list, and there we go. We have just the documents that are going to be on the exhibit list. Now I hit this, and let's make sure that it, it is correct now, and it is. Look, I've got the exhibit number in the first column on the left. The title of the report is good. It says plaintiff's exhibit list. I've got the date, the full name, the short name, and the pages. And uh, I've got what is a, uh, an excellent exhibit list and a, uh, a very convenient way to do it. Now, keep in mind that as I go, if I am working on this throughout the day, I'm going to add, I decide that I want to add uh, this as an exhibit. Well, I can either hand type in the exhibit number, right? P. Zero, 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 0006 and then run my filter again my save filters plaintiff's exhibit list and notice that six is now included if I wanted to I could renumber all of these I can just add new ones I could um, lots of possibilities but once you set this uh, again it all starts by having the exhibits all brought into case map and linked by files. So uh, let's go ahead and generate the exhibit list. It says it's entitled plaintiff's exhibit list. It's going to ask me if I want to embed copies of these documents within the PDF report. Uh, if I've got exchange exhibits, I will embed them and send them to my opponent. So my opponent will have all of the uh, exchanged exhibits with the list as the index. Uh, but for our purposes now, I'm not going to embed them and I've got my exhibit list here in PDF format, exhibits one through six. And notice that I, there are no paper clips here, and that's because I didn't embed the documents. And there you have it. That is a simple, easy way to use case map to generate an exhibit list. Let's now talk about how to create a privileged log using case map. Again, what we're doing is we're just manipulating and filtering and sorting our documents that are on the document table. But this time we're going to do it in order to produce a privilege log for uh, our opponent. Now, keep in mind that as a technical matter, if you have privileged documents, and by privileged I mean documents that are covered by uh, either the, usually the attorney-client privilege or the lawyer work product 
doctrine, but it could be other privileges. It could be a spousal privilege, a priest penitent privilege, or a medical uh, type privilege. Whatever the privilege is, you have a privilege not to produce that document to your opponent, even though the document is responsive to a otherwise relevant and otherwise acceptable request for the production of documents. So, um, if if that's what you um, what we're talking about here is a privilege log. Now, again, under the federal rules, if you're going to claim privilege as to a document um, and you're not going to produce it, you have to give a log to the plaintiff, which describes in general terms what the document is, usually who the parties to the conversation or the document, uh, the communication are, and, or were, and also the date of the document. Uh, just basic minimal information. So how will we do that? Let's assume that uh, we're going to now review for privilege all of the documents in our database. Now again, in our sample case here, we only have seven or eight documents. In a real case, you'd have more. But let's assume that these documents are the ones we're going to review for privilege. Well, the first thing we need to do is add a field, so insert field for privilege. And there's one, one of these baked into case map, privilege. So if, for example, I decide that this first letter, uh, I would open it up in Acrobat, I would review it, and I would say, OK, well, that's not privileged. So I would say, uh, no not privileged. Then I would go to the next one. Now, why did I bother putting in not privileged rather than just leaving it blank? Well, I want to know that I've already reviewed this for privilege, so by marking it as not privileged, I can know that I don't have to go back and review it for privilege later. All right, so, uh, assume though that I review this one, and this one is privileged, and it falls under the attorney-client privilege. I would mark it as attorney-client privilege, and then I would keep going. If this one falls under the attorney work product doctrine, I would call it that. Uh, if this one was not privileged, I would call it that. And I would just keep on going like this. Now, suppose I came across one that felt that fell within the, um, say, priest penitent privilege. Very rare, but... Sorry, I'm misspelling it. That's going to ask me if I want to add that to the list, and the answer is yes, I will. Okay, now you see it'll it'll appear as an option. If this one is a medical or healthcare provider privilege, it'll ask me if I want to add it. Yes. Say so this is just plain old attorney-client privilege. And this one is attorney, client, and work product privilege, both. All right, so now I've got my list of privileged documents. Of course, the ones that are not privileged, and it's only two of them, don't need to be on my privilege log. So what do I want to do? Well, I want to run my save filters and, and just leave privileged documents. And what does it do? It filters out, look at, look at the filter, Privileged documents plus leaves out not privileged. So we've got all of our privileges. Attorney-client privilege, attorney work product, priest penitent, healthcare provider privilege, attorney client, attorney client, attorney work product. Now, this may be ready to go if the laws of your jurisdiction require that you include the people involved in the communication then you might have to insert a field and add a field like for author uh, or I might just create a new field called participant and um, and make that a field that uh, that can accept names of people on the person's list. Okay, so now that I've got all the privileged documents, um, the next thing that I would probably do, in fact, the next thing that I would do is I would generate a report. Now, of course, this still has the title of plaintiff's exhibit list. I'm going to change that and change the title of the report to uh, plaintiff's privilege log. And 
there it is, a log of all the documents. Zoom in so you can see. Date of the document, the privilege that's asserted, the title of the document is correct, the full name of the, of the uh, document, the short name, and the number of pages. Okay, then I'm going to print this to PDF. Now, I'm definitely not going to attach copies of these documents. Why? Because they're privileged. I would never produce them. I'm just going to produce a list. So, no, I'm not going to attach them. And do I want to open it now? Yes. And there is our privilege log, ready to produce to our opponent in compliance with the applicable rules of procedure.